asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Now you will know that House Intelligence Committee Republicans said yesterday they have no evidence that either Donald Trump, the US President, or his associates plotted with Russians to win the 2016 election. Staggeringly, the the Democrats, in the guise of Adam Schiff, said today that they are exploring other possibilities, other avenues. This is all going on at the same time, of course, that the United Kingdom media is in meltdown over the alleged Russian attack or authorised Russian attack on former double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter, Yulia. It's been quite a while since our guest was on the programme. Uh, somebody we have great admiration for. Spent many years as a CIA analyst, briefing presidents like JFK, providing the daily brief for them. He writes at Consortium News and also on his own website, raymcgovern.com, bookmark those sites. His articles are terrifically briefed. Why wouldn't they be? And very thought-provoking and anathema, I suppose, to the, well, the disgusting conduct of journalists in mainstream media. Let's welcome back to the programme our old friend, Ray McGovern. Ray, thanks so much for coming back on with us today. How are you? Are you welcome, Richie? Glad to be with you. I'm I'm fine, thank you. Thanks for doing it, Ray. Let's start off with the Sergei Skripal story. Now, I must inform our audience, Ray has been all over the world in recent months and weeks doing other uh, jobs. He's had domestic things to deal with uh, as well. He's not seen a lot of UK media, so I'm not trying to land Ray in it. Ray, I said to you today, I've been covering politics and geopolitics nationally, commercially, and independently for about 20 years, I've never known the nonsense. I never thought m- m- as much of, of a downer as I have on commercial and national media. I never thought we'd be in the position we're in today where the UK Defence Secretary, Gavin Williamson, told the Russians, quote, to go away and shut up. As the Russians are saying, we had no reason to target this man and his daughter. We didn't do it. This is anti-Russian propaganda. Not a single journalist in the country, Ray, has taken to their laptops or their computers to ask, what sort of a world are we living in when a UK Defence Secretary can tell a country to go away and shut up? What have you made of this, Ray? Well, I'd say first, Richie, that I admire the attempt to uh, you know go a little bit younger than the old guard when you come to things like defence ministers, but... But going down into intermediate schools to, to fetch a fellow like Williamson uh, seems a little estranged, uh, you know, that he should use the, the language of intermediate school to say, look, uh, just go away and shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? That's worse than, that's worse than John, Donald Trump, if, if, if that can be. So this whole thing is uh, has an adolescent flavor to it. Now, any Machon. Uh, who is uh, one of our Sam Adams associates for integrity and intelligence and is uh, a former MI5 person, has covered the airwaves to the extent she has been allowed, and that's not a great, very great extent, to explain what's going on here. And to note, for example, that it didn't take uh, Prime Minister May five minutes to say, ah, the Russians probably did it, uh, the Russians probably did it. And then, you know, immediately jumping to the occlusion and then having every all the media say, ah, oh, it was probably the Russians. Well, you know, aside from the fact that her former colleagues in MI5 have quite a record of assassinating people, and, and I say that advisedly, uh, it's curious. Uh, actually, it's a kind of an odd, uh, an odd coincidence that it was Annie Marshall and her partner, David Stapp, who blew the whistle on unauthorized MI6 attempts to assassinate Omar Gaddafi. Now, that was a violation, of course, of the Official Secrets Act. And the result was that Annie and David had to go on the lam and and spent the next couple of years hiding in France, okay? So, 
assassination, you know, something that any and David didn't think was quite right, especially if it wasn't authorized by the queen or by the highest government officials. Now, the other thing that I would just mention is that David Kelly, who was the chief UN inspector for chemical weaponry and who was widely renowned. I know people who cried when he died. People, other, other weapons inspectors like Scott Ritter, who ran the, the whole Iraqi operation. Why? Because he's such a consummate uh, professional. What got him into trouble? Well, when Tony Blair and his assistants were drumming up support for an unnecessary war against Iraq, um, David Kelly made the mistake of saying, well, you know, the evidence really, what he meant to say was uh, it was a crock, I guess you British, you called yeah. it a rubbish, rubbish. Uh, the, 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 the Russians have a nice thing. They, they call it the uh, chish. <laughs> it's almost onomatopoeia. Chish, polny chish. That's what uh, Putin called all these, this stuff about Russia Gate. But anyhow, he called it rubbish. Now, what happened? Well, guess what? He, quote, committed suicide. Now, end quote. I don't believe that for a minute. No, neither do all I. The all the circumstances were crazy. They didn't do, do an autopsy, autopsy. There was no, yeah, was he depressed? Well, maybe he felt kind of badly at what the, what the British were doing with, together with George Bush and Dick Cheney to invade another country. Maybe that's enough to depress you. But there was no indication that he was about to commit suicide. And the circumstances attending the act itself were incredibly suspicious. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that it's much more likely that MI5 or, you know, it's got a whole bunch of contractors. OK, some of them are Israelis. Uh, they do this stuff very artfully. And that's what I suspect here. Why? Well, to blame the Russians. Now, what's the point of blaming the Russians? Well, if you have no other friends and you're, you get this Brexit problem and you want to keep the, and the Americans as you perceive them, uh, the, the people in charge in Washington, you want to keep them on your side. Well, I'm, you got to join the blame the Russians uh, game. The last thing I'll say here is that we intelligence analysts used to place a high premium on logic. OK, now uh, that's sort of dis in disrepute these days, but. Why would, <laughs> what logical reason would the Russians have to do in uh, this person's script ball? Why, why, there's no earthly reason or rationale that I can think of. It reminds me, for example, of the so-called sarin poison gas attack on uh, people in Ghouta and Syria um, back in August, it was August uh, 11th, I think, uh, 2013. Now, what happened? Oh, that was blamed on the regime of Bashar Assad. Who, who, who blamed that? George John, <laughs> John Kerry John got Kerry. out. Uh, he said no, no, no fewer than 35 times. Bashar Assad did this. Bashar Assad did this. Bashar. Al did he do it? No. Who did it? The Turks facilitated the precursors of these chemicals down to the, quote, uh, moderate, end quote, rebels that we fund and supported there in Syria. They did it. And we know that to be a fact now. Even Obama, <laughs> even Obama talking to, uh, to somebody who's going to be sort of his, uh, his uh, biographer, uh, Goldberg from The Atlantic, he said, you know, when all this stuff was going on about Bashar al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad uh, committing this act, uh, uh, James Clapper, uh, James Clapper, who was head of the national intelligence setup, like guru over everyone, he he came he came and visited me unannounced uh, that last week in August, and he said, "Now uh, about Bashar al-Assad being responsible for that chemical attack in Ghouta." On the 11th of August, Mr. President, I don't know how to quite say this, but um, well, what did I? Yeah, maybe I say it this way: uh, it's not a slam dunk. Okay, you got you got that, Mr. President. It's it's not a slam dunk. Now, how do we know that? Obama, Obama told Jeffrey Goldberg that, and he was sort of proud at not having been what mousetrapped into attacking 
Syria. Now, why do I mention all that? Because the Syrian government was on the march. They had dislodged rebels, bad and moderate, <laughs> from yeah. all manner of positions that they had earlier. And they were just about to win the whole thing when all of a sudden, whoops, there's this sarin attack in, in Ghouta. And uh, everyone is up in arms about the very, very bad uh, Bashar al-Assad. The same thing happened uh, back in April of last year when there was a claimed sarin attack in that little town in Idlib province in Syria. What was that all about? Well, I won't go through all the details, but it was a crock. And what I say is this. Uh, physical evidence, physical evidence from the people such as Ted Postel, uh, Professor Emeritus from MIT, and others have pointed out, number one, that the so-called crater that was supposed to have uh, been done by the, by the missile carrying this agent was a, was a phony. But number two, we found out that people were being delivered to hospitals, uh, victims of sarin or some kind of poison, before the plane that flew over this site discharged anything. So there was sort of a temporal problem there. Yeah. Because it's really hard to blame the these terrible victims of these gas attacks uh, on a plane that didn't uh, didn't really go over that area for you know for a couple hours after. So the whole thing is, is you know chemical weapon. Oh, that rings big. It rings big, bigger in in Europe, I suppose, than it does here in the United States. But it rings big. So if you want to blame the Russians for yet another thing, ha ha, you know perpetrate this thing. I do not put it past MI5 or MI6 at all. You would imagine with the World Cup looming and with the elections looming in Russia, also added to the fact that in the last couple of weeks, Russia has been accused of standing by while chlorine gas is used in eastern Ghouta again, again with no evidence to support that. You could imagine FSB hierarchy warning their agents and their assets, listen, we don't give, these people are telling you know, obviously gargantuan lies about what it is Russia is doing. So we don't do anything that would give them, you know, a big stick to, to beat us with. It, it doesn't make any sense that they would attempt to murder this man. And I was thinking of, of you today, Ray, and all your experience. And one of the things that came to mind was Skripal ended up here because of a spy swap. Um, he was convicted of treason in Russia, spent some time in jail there, and eventually... Um, was was part of a spy swap. You would also imagine, Ray, correct me if I'm wrong, but these agencies like the FSB and the CIA and MI5, they know that, you know, to all intents and purposes, there might be a, a time in the future when they might need to swap spies again. They might need to recover somebody and they might need to do a deal. And by killing Skripal all these years later, that would put... Um, you know, that that would put future swaps and future deals in jeopardy. Am I right in saying that? Well, that's correct. And uh, the other points that I would make are the following. Uh, Skripa made an awful lot of enemies. And a lot of people got killed. A lot of British agents got killed. So it's not like uh, Skripa doesn't have a lot of enemies right there in Britain. Um, there are other factors that, that were that work themselves into here. Uh, for example, now when MI6 does a swap like this, or when when CIA does, uh, there's a certain kind of witness protection regime imposed. Uh, it's a little different, but what you do is you keep track of these people and you make sure nobody harms them. Okay, he's a he's a prime. He's a, a prime spy for MI6, and he's now he's now he's back safe. You don't let anybody do him in. So, what I would say is that MI6, just as the CIA would have in this country in similar circumstances, has a kind of not only a moral but a sensibly, uh, you know, kind of realistic obligation to take care of this guy, make sure that he's not done in and not poisoned. So there's that too. And there's all kinds of uh, attendant circumstances as to why they would do this on a front on a bench and all that kind of stuff. It smells really bad to me, Richie. And the question of course is, 
is it simply a matter of Theresa May uh, trying to, you know, put herself in, in really, really, really good taste with the, what she perceives to be the reigning forces in, in Washington? Is that all it is here? Uh, is it a naive adolescent like Williamson, who who's a pretty face, but he looks like he should be back in intermediate school? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, shut up, Russians, shut up. Right? Yeah, I said shut up. I mean, give me a break. Is that what we've come to in these two countries? It's terrible. It's bad enough him behaving like that, Ray, but it's even worse that the media is absent. You know, if you go to bbc.co.uk, skynews.com, there's no criticism of it. It's just being reported. Ray McGovern is our guest, folks. It's really, really good to have Ray back on the programme. Um, Consortium News is, I'm going to tweet links and put links on Facebook, but you know where to find Ray anyway. Go to raymcgovern.com. We are going to talk in a few minutes about the new uh, head of the CIA and we are going to talk about the shenanigans uh, on the Hill yesterday with the House Republicans who despise Trump, it would appear, saying, look, we can't find any collusion between him and his people and the Russians and yet the Democrats today saying, well, we think that we'll still be able to prove it. These are important things and, of course, they're connected. Two final things, Ray, just to mention on, on Skripal. The Organisation for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, their rules in terms of how these things are investigated are pretty clear. Countries should be given proper time to respond. I think it's a 10-day period. And they strongly recommend, as far as I can tell, that you share some of the, the evidence with the accused, with the accused country. So Russia is entitled to have a sample of this stuff sent to them for analysis. And to be fair, there is one presenter, a woman called Rachel Burden, works for BBC Radio, and she asked a couple of politicians today, well, why, why are people arguing with the notion that Russia should be given some of the nerve agent to analyse for itself? And she was slapped down. And the other thing to mention as well is, it seems that the claim that this Novichuk agent could only be made in Russia, that claim is being dismissed by people all over the world. There are several books, one that you can buy on Amazon, about Russian biological weapons factories back in the 70s and 80s. And the compounds for this particular nerve agent are pretty straightforward, apparently, and pretty easy to buy. So a lot of lies are being told. And I think we've even moved past the, you know, are the Russians guilty or not? It seems that. And even Jeremy Corbyn, Ray, who yesterday quite rightly said in Westminster listen, we, we have to follow the evidence before we jump to conclusions. It seems that elements of Corbyn's party have beaten him into submission and even today he changed his tune a bit and said, well, OK, well, it's, it's, it's the Russians one way or the other. Um, it's, a dread, it's a dreadful situation, really, when, when, when nobody is standing up to it, Ray. Yeah. Well, you know, um, Rachel, uh, the uh, journalist that you mentioned, uh, it's very much to her credit that she would ask these innocent but highly relevant questions. And, uh, yeah, I'm really sorry that she, like so many people on this side of the pond, are called uh, the equivalent of poutine puppets for simply yeah. asking that the long established rules, guidelines by the people who monitor these chemical weapons should be observed. So maybe it's arcane, maybe it's archaic or, or sort of, uh, Oh, you know, sort of out of date that uh, people should say, well, there's a regulation here. Um, the uh, Convention on Chemical Weapons, you know, it's very specific that, that you give people time to respond. Well, you know, that's all out the window because who cares about international law anymore? It's a, it's a very sad set of circumstances. It's, uh, gosh, uh, you go back 15 years to the attack on Iraq which is, uh, what, almost exactly 15 years ago, and you have utter disregard for international law, the UN, or anything else, and we have uh, the British once again. I mean, I thought that there could be nothing more subservient than Tony Blair uh, sort of bowing to George Bush so that they could both look like tough guys and end up killing a million people. A million people, all right? And it ain't... It ain't ended yet. Now, I thought that couldn't be anything worse than that. Well, <laughs> uh, this, uh, this play, this business where the entire British press, like the American press, will support this uh, 
this hoax, this business that the Russians, for, for reasons best known to them, killed uh, an ex, uh, you know, former, former British spy, that strains credulity. And uh, the other thing, of course, with respect to the chemical weapons, well, we know that uh, when George, not George Bush, but uh, Barack Obama was about to lash out and strike Syria overtly using his Air Force and his Navy and back in early September 2013 because of this alleged sarin attack uh, uh, blamed on Bashar al-Assad, we know that Putin bailed him out. President Vladimir Putin, he said, look, uh, Barack, don't you remember? We have that working group going on and, and they're, they're just about to persuade the Syrians to give up all their chemical weapons. <laughs> Obama says, oh yeah, really? And he says, yeah, I'll tune in tomorrow to TV. The, the Syrian foreign minister is going to announce that Syria has decided to relinquish, to give up its nuclear, its nuclear, its chemical weapons under UN supervision to be destroyed on that wonderful ship you have out there in the Mediterranean, specifically configured to destroy chemical weapons. And Obama says, you can, he will, and he did. And guess what? No one knows this, maybe in Britain as well as the United States. Every single one of those chemical weapons, they were superannuated. They were all Russian stocks, okay? They were destroyed. How do we know that? Because it was under UN supervision. They destroyed all those weapons on that US ship within six months, and that's where that rests. Now, how many people know that? Well, no one reading the Telegraph or even the Times mm. or the Observer or the Guardian, for God's sake, nobody knows that stuff. Last thing I'll say is that when I was still on active duty with the CIA, we had a new guy come in under Reagan. His name was William Casey. Now, I know this from a very good friend who was at the White House at the time. And in February of 1991, Casey appeared at his first briefing at the White House. And there were a lot of, you know, cabinet ministers and so forth. And they were all asked for their opinions. And what Casey said was, we'll know that we've succeeded in our task when all Americans are persuaded to believe what we want them to believe. Now, uh, is that something made up? No, Barbara Honega was there. She has she recorded it immediately and gave it to the press. So that was 1981. Well, you know, if you look at the at what is what passes for the mainstream press in this country, you'll see that Bill Casey and his acolytes have succeeded beyond their fondest dreams to make sure that nothing gets in The New York Times unless the CIA and others are asked beforehand, is this okay? Can we do this or, or how do we play this? And that's it's documented. We have guys writing for the Washington Times, the Washington Post that have emails disclosed, uh, emails with the PR people at the at the CIA saying, is this okay? Or what do you think of it? Should I put a little twist on this? So it's really bad, but how, how will people know that? How will people, <laughs> people know that? By the way, if you go to raymcgovern.com, you'll see that video, by the way, Ray's alluding to about William Casey. Ray, just before, we're going to take a 90 second break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Russiagate. We're going to talk about what happened yesterday and today. And we'll talk about the CIA. But you know, you, you, it's brilliant speaking with you again, Ray. It's been too long. I mean that. And I'm, I'm not kissing your, your ass here. I, re, I, I love speaking to you. Your integrity and your honesty is fantastic. You know, you're, you're talking about the media. You mentioned quite rightly that the 20th of the month, which is five days away, will be the 15th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq. And you will probably remember, but many of our listeners won't remember, that on that day that the bombs were being launched and the airplanes were flying, Katie Voights was a journalist with the Sun newspaper, Murdoch's newspaper in London, um, a features editor. And Katie stood up it was almost like a Jerry Maguire moment. She packed her bags and she walked out and she said, I can't stand working for a newspaper that's cheerleading what's obviously a, a wrongful and illegal invasion. And this jingoistic nonsense that the paper is carrying on with, I can't tolerate it, she said. I can't work for a paper that won't challenge it. And she walked out, Ray. And apparently colleagues of hers on the day said they admired her, but nobody went with her. 
And I just want to remember her because that took enormous courage that back in 2003. But she was, you know, she sadly she was a lone journalist at that time. We'll take a 90 second break, Ray, if that's OK with you. Um, and we'll come back and we'll get straight into um, what happened yesterday on the Hill, Russia Gate. the Republicans saying that um, there's nothing in it and they can't find anything and Adam Schiff and the Democrats saying something else. Ray McGovern stays with us. This is only a 90 second break. Don't go anywhere. Back in a minute with Thursday's Richie Allen show. Stay uh, right there. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www. Markbayerski.com. It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on richieallen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv Welcome back. The activist and the former CIA analyst briefed five, six presidents uh, in his time. Uh, retired with honours, highly respected. Uh, the great Ray McGovern is our guest today. Go to raymcgovern.com, consortium news and read Ray uh, pretty much daily articles from uh, Ray. Terrific stuff. Glad that, that he stayed with us. Thanks for staying with us, Way. We've got Ray till uh, around about the top of the hour, maybe a couple of minutes after that, uh, if he can hang around uh, with us today. Um, mentioned earlier on, um, and we're going to talk about this now, the House Intelligence Committee Republicans said yesterday, through Mike Conaway, that they had found no evidence that Donald Trump or his aides had plotted with Russians to win the 2016 election. This is a saga that runs on and on and on. The BBC reported that Democrats on the panel were furious, saying the investigation had been prematurely ended. And Adam Schiff said today, uh, effectively, I'm not, uh, I'm not quoting him uh, word for word, paraphrasing, that there were other options and that the Democrats would continue the investigation into the activities of Trump and his team before and during the... Uh, election of 2016. This is not going away, Ray, despite the fact that even those, seemingly many of those who detest Trump the most, are conceding that there's nothing to this, there's nothing here. What's going on, Ray? Well, it's good you mentioned that, Richie, because uh, we, we have this sort of antiquated attitude that uh, the truth matters. Uh, that's what we used to do back before Bill Casey at the CIA in the analysis division. Uh, we try to seek out the truth because we really thought that what the Bible says it would keep us free, it would set us free. So uh, truth matters, and it doesn't seem to matter much anymore. Um, this Russiagate thing is, I come from the Bronx, okay? We call we would call it a crock, okay? <laughs> yeah. uh, this you all would call it rubbish. Rubbish. Yes. Garbage, yeah. There's lots of other words, you know, in, in Russian and German. Yeah, the, the Bavarians call it the 
quatsch. <laughs> so there's onomatopoeia involved here. But long story short, uh, this whole thing was born of uh, an attempt before our election in November of 2016 to, to brand Trump as a puppet of Putin. And Hillary thought that that would resonate with Americans, that he uh, was in love with, with Putin. Okay, well, it didn't. It didn't. Americans cared more about jobs and jobs loss and stuff like that. So yeah. to her utter amazement and to the amazement of 98% of the American people, she lost. Now, how could it be that Hillary Clinton lost? I mean, it couldn't possibly because very few people trusted her or, or that she was a terrible candidate or, or that she was guilty of really, really careless handling of the most sensitive information. No, it couldn't be any of that. It got it. Right. So I blame it on the Russians. Okay. And when this first came up before, before the Democratic National Convention in August of 2016, uh, this was right after WikiLeaks revealed all these emails and other messages. Now, what do those messages show? Well, were they authentic first? Of course they were authentic. That's, that's the only thing that Julian Assange deals in. Uh, so what did they say? Well, they said, pure and simple, that Hillary and her colleagues on the Democratic National Committee had stolen the nomination from Bernie Sanders. No misunderstanding that. It's right there in black and white. Now, what happened? Well, <laughs> that was three days before the convention. And you could just see Hillary sitting around with her, with her advisor. What can I do? What we can do? My God! What, what will Bernie do? What will there be? What will, what will the convention happen? Oh my God! And somebody says, "Well, I know what we do. We'll, we'll blame it on the Russians." And somebody else says, "Well, wait a second. It, it wasn't the Russians. It was, it was WikiLeaks. That's okay. Look, it's a twofer. Uh, we hate WikiLeaks just as much as the Russians. We'll say." that the Russians hacked into the uh, DNC and gave the proceeds to WikiLeaks. And, they, they, and, and then we get the whole press, the whole mainstream media to focus on that. Then nobody will read the emails. Nobody will see that we stole <laughs> it. worked like a charm. The oh, New York Times, Washington Post. So that was phase one, okay? The Russians hacked. We can prove by forensic evidence, by physical principles like fluid dynamics, that it was impossible that the thing that they blame as a Russian hack was a hack at all. It was downloaded from the DNC computers at a speed that three times as, as fast as the internet was uh, in July of 2016. So it wasn't a hack. It was a download onto a thumb drive and it was downloaded at precisely the same speed that a thumb drive at, of that vintage could handle. So there was no Russian hack, but no, 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 you, you get the thing going and okay, so she loses. Now what? Ah, they've got the, the, the fertile field plowed already. Now you blame it on the Russians. Now, what's the side effect here? Side effect is that these major defense contractors and defense uh, arms builders and arms uh, merchants and arms traders, they profiteer on tension with Russia. I mean, let's face it, uh, peace is really bad for business. Uh, you let Trump do what he wants to do. My God, uh, what will happen to Lockheed or Raytheon or General Dynamics or, or BO, you guys over there? You know, so uh, that was uh, the side benefit. And now we have the Democrats playing footsie with these large arms dealers to make sure that tensions with Russia uh, reach a peak that has not existed, that not existed, Richie, since since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Now they don't seem to be either aware or very much. Uh, they don't give a a yeah, rat's patootie yeah. about the dangers there, but the dangers are real, and that's why all this is very consequential stuff. Now, getting back to what you asked me about, yes, the House Intelligence Committee, the majority is a Republican. That's the way we work in this country. You win the election, uh, the Senate has a majority of Republicans, the chairman of all the committees are Republican. So what did, they, what did they decide? They decided, and I quote, there is no evidence 
of collusion, coordination, or conspiracy between the Trump campaign and the Russians. Well, that was the major task at hand. Now, when the Democrats say, oh, well, it's premature, they've been at it for over a year, Richard. A year, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah, it's never ending, Ray. That's absolutely. But yeah. more important, and this is something like, it's still a little hard to explain, but I started out this thing by trying to say, well, let, let's let's keep it it's simple here, okay? And um, when I say this, you know, quote, so it's as clear as can be, basic rationale behind charges that Putin interfered with the 2016 US election to help Trump, that basic rationale rests, of course, on the assumption that Moscow preferred Trump to Hillary Clinton. Whoa, what does the House Intelligence Committee say about that? It says that there's no evidence to support, quote, Putin's supposed preference for candidate Trump, period, end quote. Now, let me explain that, okay? Um, you could say, oh, well, look, Trump said he wanted to have a decent relationship with the Russians. Yeah, right. Well, Putin's, uh, you know, he's been around for a while. He knows what's possible within our body politic, within the, the, the context of a, a domineering defense industry, he knows what's possible. Besides that, when when this legend became, became current, started to be built, you know, I objected by saying, look, I've been watching the Russian, the Soviet and Russian leadership for 50 years now. Okay, I think I know a little bit about uh, how the Russians look at these things. I was chief of the Soviet foreign policy branch of CIA. Now, what I think is this. Here's Putin sitting around with his advisors, right? And he's watching, watching the campaign. And he's saying, my God, <laughs> at Trump, at, well, Trump is really something. He, He's not only unpredictable, but he brags about being unpredictable and <laughs> he lashes out at any, yeah. any slight, real or perceived. Man, oh, this is exactly, this going to be a lot of fun to have him <laughs> cross the ocean with his fingers on the nuclear codes. Bring him on. Let's help him. Let's help him win. Give me a break. It doesn't parse. It doesn't parse at all. And uh, But, you know, it doesn't take much to... Uh, to persuade the poorly educated American people who think they get the real deal from the New York Times. That once was the case, like 40 years ago. But my God, it's no longer the case. So the American people have been duped. And my informal survey says that 80% of them believe that the Russians did interfere in our election. Madness. <laughs> and, and the irony, you, you, you quite rightly allude to the fact it's been going on for so long. One of the great ironies, of course, is that the um, the uh, the the Hollywood film the 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 post of course has been a big film over the last six eight nine ten months, harking back to a time you mentioned forty years ago coincidentally, when real journalists asked real questions, and had the courage to, you know, stand up to elected officials and elected authority, uh, Ray. I've got to ask you this. You don't have to answer it, of course. Um, there, there are no absolutes here, my friend. But listeners are saying to me on Twitter, it's difficult for Ray to know for certain. But would Ray be suspicious as to the death of the former staffer, Seth Rich, with respect to the hacking of the DNC servers? Seth Rich, death, it's not sat well with a lot of people, Ray, for a long time. What do you think? Uh, it sits as well with me as the so-called suicide of David Kelly. Right. In other words, it stinks to high heaven. Now, uh, what do we know? Well, we know this is supposed to have been a robbery, but the robbers uh, forgot to take anything from Seth Rich. Yeah. We know that he worked in the Democratic National Committee and that he had access to these kinds of things. Uh, we know that he had been a, uh, a fan of Bernie Sanders. Whoa. So picture this. He gets to the National Democratic National Committee. He reads some of these emails released by WikiLeaks, and he sees some of the internal, other internal emails from the DNC. He said, my God, I mean, this is awful. They really did steal the nomination from, from my friend Bernie. So he's got incentive, right? Besides that, we have Cy Hirsch 
who is, he didn't know he's being recorded, but he talks about the notion, well, he doesn't talk about the notion, he talks about the fact that he's been told that Seth Rich was in contact with several, several emails with WikiLeaks. So, Julian Assange, head of WikiLeaks, what has he said? Well, when this came, uh, came onto the front burner, he was being interviewed by a Dutch journalist on TV. And he said, Julian said, you know, this shows the dangers that whistleblowers uh, risk when they decide to reveal the truth. And the Dutch guy said, oh, are you saying that he's your source? And Assange said, we never reveal our sources, but we are offering a $20,000 reward for anyone who can figure out, uh, who can tell us who murdered, uh, who killed Seth Rich. Well, hello. <laughs> now, what, what's besides all that? Well, we have a, a, a movement. I don't call it an organization. It's called better. It's called Sam Adams Associates for Integrity and Intelligence. Annie Machon, who I mentioned before, is a, is a charter member. So is Craig Murray, Ambassador Craig Murray, uh, UK ambassador, That's right. formerly That's right. Uzbekistan. But he didn't like uh, receiving the proceeds of torture sessions. He objected to the foreign office and the foreign office says, well, don't be squeamish about that. As long as as long as British people are not doing it, as the Americans are doing it, you report it. And he said, I'm out of here. You know, and so so Craig Murray is a former winner. Now, why do I mention all that? Well, two years ago, when we honored John Kiriakou with the annual award from the Sam Adams Associates for Integrity and Intelligence, we asked Craig to come to Washington and MC the ceremonies, which he did. We were at American University. He did a great job. He's a great ad libber. And, and as we left, uh, we said, we're going out for a couple of drinks now, Craig. Uh, will you come with us? Now, for the first time in history, and I know Craig pretty well by now, uh, Craig said, no, I, I, I'm not going to join you for drinks. And all of a sudden, he disappeared behind a little hillock behind the place where we had the ceremony at American University. <laughs> he, did, he didn't show up for the rest of the time. Now, there was something, a mystery to that. But two weeks later, we learned he had met with someone connected with the, the leak that was gotten to Julian Assange with respect to the DNC emails. Now, he's been real careful. He said it wasn't the source, but it was somebody who was familiar with what was going on and that uh, all he could say is, that he could guarantee without any uh, obfuscation uh, that uh, uh, the Russians were not responsible for giving WikiLeaks this information. He knows who did it, and it wasn't the Russians, okay? So you have Craig Murray saying that. Where does the thing lie now? Well, the Seth Frisch Lodge is being invested by the FBI. Why do I go? <laughs> because the FBI has been shown to be part of this deep state, thoroughly corrupted, with its deputy director about to be fired just a couple of months before he could retire for, for cause, okay? Now, the FBI, which has been deeply involved in pushing this Russiagate thing, they're gonna invest Seth Rich? I'm sorry. Investigate. Investigate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give me a break. So what you have on this side of the pond, Richie, is an incredible, I've, you know, I've seen a lot of corruption. You know, I've been around 55 years in town, this town, but my God, I mean, you couldn't write a, a script that would sell. It's just too unbelievable how thoroughly corrupted what we call deep state, and it's real, okay? It's the FBI, it's the CIA, it's the NSA, and parts of, guess what? The Department of Justice. Now, the supreme irony, Richie, is that all this stuff that, you know, the, the sacrosanct Robert Mueller is investigating. And how do you get the job? Well, he got the job because James Comey, the fired previous head of the FBI, leaked something to the New York Times. And when they asked him why he leaked that, he said, well, I wanted a special counsel uh, appointed as soon as possible. And guess what? Two days later, a special counsel was, a pro uh, was appointed. And who was it? Thank you, Jesus. It was my old friend, Bob Mueller. 
Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. The iron just comes in here, okay? Mueller's the one who he invites uh, people from the, people who had worked for Hillary Clinton, people who have defended her in court, people, and people, half of his staff had given major contributions to Hillary Clinton. I don't know about the others. Maybe they got them from, from, you know, from the street. But there they are, okay? Now, what happens? Uh, the Inspector General of the Department of Justice uh, looks at all this material and finds out that the head of counterintelligence, a guy named Peter Strzok, and his paramour, Lisa Page, who worked directly for the deputy director of the FBI, uh, they're exchanging these these voicemails. Not voicemails, but what do you call them? Texts. Text messages, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and one of their exchanges, she says, Peter, are you sure that these texts can't be gotten by anybody else? He says, oh, no problem. It's because we're really hard on Hillary Clinton. I mean, we're really uh, in favor of Hillary Clinton. We're really hard on Trump. No, 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 don't worry about it. <laughs> Here's the head of counterintelligence. My God, he doesn't know. Anyhow, the IG gets these texts, okay? Now, here's the question. Is he a quintessential honest guy? And is that why he told Congress, whoops, look at this. These guys were out to to make sure Trump didn't win. And once he did win, make sure he was emasculated. Did he go to Congress and say, hey, I got this stuff? Or did somebody on his staff leak it? I think it's more likely the latter. But anyhow, Congress was told about this. And sure enough, right before they had a major hearing on all this, uh, the IG, the, the Inspector General of the Department of Justice served up these very damaging emails, which show that the FBI and the Department of Justice, together with the CIA and to a lesser extent NSA, were out, number one, to do Trump's campaign in, and number two, to make sure that he couldn't function once he became president. That's, those, those are documents, okay? That's the real deal on the, uh, on, on the uh, reality of, uh, of the deep state. And I guess I got into this by mentioning Seth Rich. And I'll just say once again, so what's, what percentage would you give uh, the FBI of coming clean and doing a creditable job on Seth Rich? Where is his computer? Oh, the FBI has his computer. Well, you know, it's going to come out. I just come, I just hope that it comes out early enough so that people will be held accountable. Because what happens in this town is nobody is ever held accountable, whether for this or for torture or anything else. And so it can happen again. Of course it can. I want to remind our listeners, Ray is a Intelligence Commendation Medal recipient. That's an um, incredib incredibly prestigious um, award by the Central Intelligence Agency. Ray McGovern is live on the line with us now. We've got Ray for a few more minutes. We are going to talk about the CIA now. Go to raymcgovern.com and um, read Ray there. Bookmark his website if you haven't done so uh, before. Ray, Trump has nominated um, a woman called Gina Haspel to, um, to head up the CIA. There's a very interesting article in the Guardian newspaper yesterday. Wonderful lead into this. Who is Gina Haspel? And the byline is Trump's pick for CIA chief linked to torture, I should say the subheading, Trump's pick for CIA chief linked to torture uh, site. Now you dedicated most of your life to service through the CIA, most of your professional life I should say, Ray. So who is Gina Haspel then? <laughs> well first I need to tell you uh, and your audience that I did, uh, they invited me back from retirement to give me the Intelligence Commendation Medal, this big medallion, uh, but I, I threw it back at them. I threw it back at them on the 1st of May, 1966, when it became clear to me that the director of central intelligence and, um, and other people were openly admitting that the, that the CIA was doing torture. Yeah. Um, now, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want my grandchildren to ask me, Oh, Hey, Hey, uh, grandpa, how do you, how do you feel about the CIA doing torture uh, without me having been able to well, that means being able to say, look, you know, when I, as soon as I learned about this, uh, I threw this medallion back at them and I don't, I said, I don't want to be associated in any way, however remotely with an agency involved in torture. Now, Gina Haspel was the torturer in chief of the 
black site in Thailand where people like Abu Zubaydah was boarded, was waterboarded 83 times, okay, 83 times. Now, we know that. Uh, what happened to the videotapes that were made at those waterboarding sessions? Well, a couple, couple years later, despite the White House counsel saying, do not destroy those tapes, uh, Gina wrote this little cable saying, destroy the tapes, and they were destroyed. Whoa. Now, that's, that's the kind of person that President Trump has nominated to be the director of the CIA. Now, I remember where you hear this first, okay? There are still enough people in this town and in this country that are hell-bent and determined to prevent that nomination from succeeding, and we will win. This cannot be allowed to, to, to go through. Torture, torture is not only illegal against national, international law. People forget that the reason it's illegal is because it's just wrong, okay? Human beings don't do that kind of stuff to other human beings. That's why there are rules against it. There are all kinds of practical reasons, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, people need to have a moral sense. And we have the Association for, for Psychology here. We have uh, the uh, National Religious uh, Group Against Torture. We have all kinds of people that we are getting together now. And if we don't succeed in this, well, I won't even say that because we will succeed. There are probably, we hope, enough senators that feel strongly about this and realize that her previous behavior cannot be excused in any manner uh, to prevent her nomination from going through. God knows who the next person Trump would nominate would be, but it can't be any worse than Gina Haspel. Andre, it's, it's believed that she personally took part in the torture of people, including um, Abu um, Zababdia. Um, I've, I've pronounced that terribly wrongly. I think he lost an eye, if I remember. In, Abu uh, Zubaydah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that him? Well, she, she personally participated in this stuff. Well, that's, uh, those are the reports. Now, yeah. interesting to note that there is a 5,000-page uh, report uh, on this issue based on authentic, original CIA cables from the field and headquarters. Uh, this was an arrangement that uh, Director Panetta made with the Senate Committee for Intelligence. Now, they got access to these things. They worked out on them for four years. They came up with a major report, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Report on CIA torture. Now, it was right at the end of the time when Democrats had the majority in the Senate. Uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein had four crackerjack investigators working for her, and the, the torture practices were atrocious. Atrocious doesn't even do them justice. But worse still, the heads of the CIA were shown to be lying through their teeth when they contended that any good intelligence ever came from any of the torture sessions, okay? So there it was. Now, it was redacted into a 500-page uh, um, executive summary. And then uh, Obama and uh, John Brennan, who was head of the CIA, had a major stake in this. They looked at the calendar and said, oh, hey, if we could drag our feet until the Senate changes, and it would change to the Republican majority in January of 2015, okay? Wait till it, and then this guy coming in, this Republican, Richard Burr from North Carolina, he'll deep six the whole thing. Well, they dragged their feet and dragged their feet. Finally, Diane Feinstein, to her great credit, went to the president and she said, look, Mr. President, I feel really strongly about this. My four people have put their life's blood into this investigation. It's been properly redacted. <laughs> people like Gina Haspel's name has been blackened out, okay? And she says, uh, you have a choice, Mr. President. We have uh, this uh, fellow from Colorado, uh, who has lost his re-election bid, and he's going to read it from the Senate floor, okay? Unless you let us go ahead with the redacted executive summary. Mark Udall was the senator I have in mind, and he had nothing to lose. Actually, he's protected 
uh, the rules allow people to read these things as the Pentagon Papers were read originally, okay? So the president says, oh, darn, the jig is up. Call up John Brennan and says, okay, release that executive summary. The executive summary, my God, is heinous. It's awful. And it, it beggars belief that there are worse things revealed in the redacted parts of the main thing. Now, what's the last thing here? When Richard Burr assumed the chairmanship of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence in January of 2005, what's the first thing he did? He said, that Senate investigation belongs to me. I recall all copies. Everyone who has a copy, and there are only five or six of them out there, give them back to me. I own those copies. Now, why do I mention that? Well, I imagine everyone complied. I do think that there's probably a copy hidden somewhere in the bowels of the CIA, okay? Now, if Gina Haspel, God forbid, becomes confirmed, guess what the first thing she's going to do? Absolutely, absolutely. She's going to give that report to, to uh, Richard uh, Burr, and it's going to be deep-sixed. It's deep in, in the Potomac River, as it can possibly be, and we'll never know the full story. Uh, this is really important. This is consequential stuff. I thought the British cared about, well, my cousins in Ireland told me the British don't really care about torture, but <laughs> there have to yeah. be some some civilized people that care about torture. This is going to play out. And just, just, just remember where you heard this. We're not going to take this thing lying down. This is a moral issue as well as a, an ethical one, and we're, we're going to oppose it to the best of our ability, Richie. It's, a brilliant, it's brilliant to end on that, Ray, because it is a massive story. And because of Skripal and his um, daughter and everything else, and because of the Russiagate investigations, it isn't getting as much coverage as, as, it, as it should do. But I do see, as I'm listening to you there, um, stuff is coming in about Rand Paul and others quite rightly endorsing what you said, saying that this woman can't be allowed to assume the directorship of the CIA. Ray, thanks for coming back on the programme. Folks, go to raymcgovern.com. Do check out consortiumnews.com. There aren't many outlets these days where you can find honest, um, terrifically researched articles and blogs and um, editorials, I suppose you could call them, uh, from people as experienced as, as, uh, as Ray McGovern. Thanks for that, Ray. I look forward to uh, speaking with you again um, this year. And um, by the way, if, if, if you want more of Ray, as well as going to his website, he did a terrific um, piece with um, Redacted with Lee Camp, who's an old friend of mine. Um, check that out. It's on YouTube now. There might be links to it on Ray's website. Uh, that was a fascinating conversation. Uh, In-depth chat as well. Check it out there. Thanks again, Ray. I really mean it. Um, brilliant having you back on. You're most welcome, Richie. Look after yourself. Bye for now. Uh, the great Ray McGovern live on the line to us there from his home, um, not far from Virginia. Check out raymcgovern.com and consortiumnews.com.